But exclusions vary in their scope and also in the specific ideologies underlying them. Legal and social remedies need to be cognizant of these variations and to craft policies aptly targeted at the particularities of the bad behavior addressed. Legal and social remedies, therefore, need to engage in a comparative study of stigma and prejudice, learning from history and from the experience of many different societies and choosing social, legal, and institutional policies in the light of that learning. Stigma has been a central category in social theory, at least since sociologist Irving Goffman's path-breaking work of that title. Psychologists have also made considerable progress over the past few decades in understanding and charting the mechanisms by which societies marginalize and discriminate. In particular, psychologist Paul Rosen's path-breaking work on disgust with a team of researchers who continue to make new discoveries all the time has revolutionized our understanding of our fraught relationship with our own animal bodies, which leads so often to evasive stratagems that impute animality only to others and not oneself, and then targets that group or groups for exclusions of various types. Discuss has also been very, a very big topic of legal theory in many countries. Conservative theorists, for example, Lord Devlin in Britain and Leon Cass, who at one time was chair of the President's Council for Bioethics in the Bush administration, appealed to popular disgust as a legitimate criterion to make certain consensual acts illegal and to engage in other types of exclusionary behavior. On um, the more progressive side, we have a lot of work in the US and Britain, but I now want to turn to India. One of the most astute theorists of disgust and exclusion, the great B.R. Ambedkar, attempted to translate his understanding of majority tyranny and exclusionary behavior into constitutional law with considerable, though not complete, success as we study. Ambedkar, well aware of human malice through his own experience as a Dalit, commented in 1948 when he proposed the new draft constitution before the Constituent Assembly, quote, if things go wrong under the new constitution, the reason will not be that we had a bad constitution. What we will have to say is that man was vile. The vileness of which Ambedkar spoke, manifold and tenacious, continues to undermine the implementation of constitutional ideals, just as related bad behavior undermines legal and constitutional norms in the United States. Because of the salience of untouchability in the Indian founding, India has on the whole been more explicitly aware than the US of the dangers inherent in the public appeal to disgust, an appeal that was sternly repudiated by the Delhi High Court when it invalidated the sodomy laws which, of course, were subsequently reinstated, as we'll hear later, by the Supreme Court. Still, so far, we lack a detailed comparative study of the varieties of prejudice and stigma that would help both law and society do better in the struggle against stigma and exclusion. It's easy to see, and it's emphasized in the psychological literature, that common tropes turn up in many different types of discrimination, but the different forms of prejudice are not all the same and the legal and social remedies are also not the same. So there's a job to do, and there are reasons to believe that this intellectual job, well done, will offer a good deal to politics and to law. Now, we're not planning here to be reductive in our focus on disgust and stigma. Prejudice and discrimination are not exhaustively traceable to disgust. Other psychological factors, such as fear of imagined violence, or guile, or competitive envy, also need exploration, and recent studies have shown clear evidence of unconscious group bias that is not clearly ascribable to any determinate emotional origin. Furthermore, discrimination has an important institutional aspect that is not reducible to bad intent. Policies may be objectionably discriminatory, even if they're not enacted with malign intent, and these factors also require close comparative study. We need to examine the many ways in which discrimination is sustained by structures as well as by popular sentiment and discourse. Therefore, while 
thinking of ideas of stigma and disgust as a kind of philosophical and psychological hub from which various aspects of the project radiate outwards, giving it a certain unity, we intend to devote sustained and independent attention to discrimination's institutional side in housing, education, employment, and political representation. On the side of remedies, we'll examine group resistance to subordination, as well as institutional, legal, public choice, and educational remedies. We're also, we've also invited participants to consider the emotional structures that are inherent in public culture, not just in institutions and laws. In a modern democracy, it's not acceptable to manipulate the psyches of individuals through coercive intervention into the development of young children in the family, where many baneful emotions are formed. However, a public culture that combats stigma has many aspects, of which laws and official policies are only one part. The use of public rhetoric, public art, public ceremonies also have an important anti-stigma role. The insights of the participants will suggest yet further directions. We're fortunate to have assembled a very distinguished group of speakers drawn both from India and from our own university, and two who are not, not from our own university, but not based in India either. Those speakers have written papers that are fuller than what they'll be able to present here at the conference. And participants in the conference have been able to read one another's papers on a special private website. So for that reason, we're going to open each discussion with a certain couple of 10 minutes or so dedicated to the participants since they've had a chance to study the other papers. But the public presentations will convey the essence. The tradition of our law school has been at major conferences to include student papers. And we follow that tradition here with three papers by uh, two advanced uh, postgraduate students from the United States and an advanced law student from India. But let me now say a little bit more about the theoretical issues using as a template the theory of disgust and stigma that I've proposed in, for a long time, but drawing on Paul Rosen's research. Not because this project as a whole will be based on that, but because it makes the relevant questions clear and I think shows the need for the project that we propose. All human beings appear to share an acute discomfort when confronted by their own bodily fluids, excretions, and smells, and by the decay of the corpse. I myself use the term primary disgust of a shrinking from contamination by such objects and by other objects that very closely resemble them in smell or feel, such as insects and animals that are slimy, smelly, etc. Primary disgust, though not present at birth apparently, does appear to be culturally universal and is probably grounded in evolutionary tendencies. Although this aversive reaction may in some cases protect people from genuine danger, and maybe that was its evolutionary origin, Paul Rosen shows that its cognitive content is quite different from that of fear of danger. There's like a lot of fascinating experiments he's done to establish that uh, and to establish that it's about contamination and not danger. So disgust is a reaction to the animality and decay of the human body, and it's both under-inclusive and over-inclusive for real danger. So many genuinely dangerous things are not disgusting, like poisonous mushrooms, notoriously, and hard to distinguish from non-poisonous mushrooms, but also people feel disgust even when they're rationally convinced that there's absolutely no danger. Rosen does a lot of experiments with sterilized cockroaches, and he tries to get people to swallow them in a capsule that will emerge untangled within the subject species, but they still won't eat it. So Rosen concludes that in disgust, we are refusing to take in and allegedly be contaminated by something about our own animality. Now, that might be harmless enough, or, although one could argue that it's always problematic to uh, encourage this kind of self-loathing. In all known societies, however, people do not stop there. And now we arrive at what I call projective disgust. That is, that people seek to create a kind of 
buffer zone between themselves and their own animality and mortality by identifying a group, and it's of course usually a powerless minority, who can be targeted as the quasi-animal, and by projecting onto that group various animal characteristics, which they have to no greater degree than the ones who are doing the projecting, such as bad smell, animal sexuality, and so on. The so-called thinking seems to be that if those quasi-animals stand between us and their own animality, our animal stench and decay, we are that much further from being animal and mortal ourselves. There's no known society in which we do not find subgroups to whom, irrationally, properties of smelliness, hypersexuality, and in general, hyperanimality are imputed. There are many varieties of disgust stigma. In European anti-Semitism, Jews were depicted as hyperbodily, smelly, and hypersexual, but also as crafty and intelligent. African Americans, by contrast, as you'll soon hear in Justin Driver's marvelous paper, were, and unfortunately at times still are, imagined as hypersexual, hyperbodily, and also smelly, bestial, and stupid. Again, African Americans have been imagined as physically powerful and aggressive, as once again Justin will show. To upper Hindu castes who observed untouchability, untouchables were seen as contaminating, but not necessarily as particularly powerful and aggressive. People with severe mental and physical disabilities are often found physically disgusting, as Nandini's paper will, will very powerfully show, and contact with them is avoided, but they're seen as weak and often as subhuman and not feared. Much of the same is true of people who are aging. So if there is fear in those two cases, but it's, a, as it were, a fear for one's own weakness, not a fear of those groups. These differences are important, and yet a common set of threads runs through all. What about the link between disgust and same-sex acts? Uh, I actually studied myself conservative pamphlet literature opposed to both uh, same-sex and the legality of same-sex acts and later same-sex marriage. That pamphlet literature attempted to whip up animosity toward gays and lesbians, but above all, gay men, by prominent use of the tropes of projected disgust. The standard way of doing this is to focus obsessively on anal sex and to describe it in terms apt to elicit revulsion. All sorts of abstract claims are made, such as the claim that gays eat feces and drink raw blood. I actually heard that claim made on the witness stand in Denver, Colorado, in the bench trial of Amendment 2, Colorado's law that denied equal, well, I can now say, since the Supreme Court has said it denies equal protection of the laws to gays and lesbians, and became the foundation for the landlord Supreme Court case, Romer versus Evans. In India, we can locate related, but not identical, phenomena. Projected disgust always leads to some type of avoidance of bodily contact. Again, the type and extent vary. African Americans were forbidden to use white people's drinking fountains, swimming pools, lunch counters, hotel beds, uh, and, and these were sustained by a kind of magical thinking about the putative contamination that would take place if these facilities were shut. And I have to mention that my own interest in this topic started from the fact that I was raised in the North, but by a Southern father who had these views, although he was a prominent lawyer and a man of science. He really did believe that when African American had touched some drinking glass, then you should not use that glass. Like, so that kind of crazy magical thinking. And of course, sexual content was strictly forbidden and was a felony in many states, widely though white men always had sexual relationships with and sexually abused black women. And yet, an African American might prepare and serve food for a white family. That was a very common arrangement. And the family did not mind that at all. An Indian Dalit, by contrast, could never serve food in a, an exclusionary upper caste family. And Dalits also could not share lodging or drinking cups, as Ambedkar, in his autobiographical writings, relates, describing his childhood in Madhya Pradesh, where 
he had to sit on a separate mat in the school and couldn't drink water, even though in other conditions, pretty hot in the middle of the day. And then when they traveled as prosperous middle class children, they could not stay in any hotel, even though they were flush with cash. The crazy irrationalities of these ideas are manifold. As for gay men, and to some extent lesbians in America, <coughs> given the reality of the closet, no ban on shared restaurants, lodgings, drinking fountains, or even swimming pools and gyms could realistically be imposed, but the desire to impose one crops up in weird places, such as the symbolic aversion to shared showers in the military. We have to say symbolic because it's well known that all gyms have a highly, fairly high proportion of gay members, and yet uh, there's never been any attempt I know to exclude gay, gay men from gym membership, which of course would be both impossible and very bad for business. Still, straight men often fantasize that the very gaze, and the very look of a gay man could penetrate and thus sully them, where they could use this to exclude gays they did. And what about discrimination against Muslims? This is a very manifold and complicated topic. Uh, Aziz Huck's paper will explore discrimination against Muslims in the United States and Europe. And then we'll hear from Zoya Hassan later about discrimination against Muslims in, in India. And, and there's quite a lot of difference, because in, I would say in the US, anyway, the dominant feeling is not discussed but fear, fear of terrorism and so on. In Europe, there's a funny combination of the fear of danger, but also the imputation of a, an aggressive sexuality that bears comparison with what Justin will report about African-American men. Uh, in India, there's even more of that. And also the imputation to Muslim women of a kind of hyper bodily, hyper fertile animal nature. So, so it's a very complicated topic. People with disabilities remind so-called normal people vividly of the limits and frailties of the human body and are often removed from the public gaze on grounds that people don't like to look at them or associate with them. My own city, Chicago, used to have what were called ugly laws that kept most people with severe disabilities off the streets and out of public sight. Testimony before the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act talked about the fear that people would be so upset by people with disabilities that they, they, they just didn't want to be in their presence. And even, I mean, one of the most awful parts was the, the exclusion from zoos on the grounds that the animals in the zoo would be upset by the presence of humans with disabilities. And so even though animals, of course, were being at the same time treated brutally and, and uh, tortured in the zoo. So, Anyway, for a long time in the US, people with both mental and physical disabilities were excluded from public education. And uh, an important US Supreme Court case, City of Cleburne versus Cleburne Living Center, dealt with an attempt by a Texas city to zone out a home for people with mental retardation. The zoning law was declared unconstitutional on the ground that it was motivated by what the court called animus toward people with disabilities. There's much more to be said about the term animus in American law, but in this case, it pretty clearly meant disgust and irrational aversion. And there's a lot to be said about how we could try to combat that through educational and social policy. One of the most tenacious kinds of prejudice is prejudice against people who are aging. They're stigmatized in popular culture and discourse, and very often law gives sanction to these forms of stigma. The bodies of aging people remind younger people of their own frailty and mortality, and popular discourse portrays those bodies as incompetent, ugly, even revolting. Moreover, aging people themselves often come to feel disgust with their own bodies as new research is proposing. This may well be the new issue for our time, since discrimination on the basis of age deprives all societies of valuable human capital. So Levmore uh, and, uh, uh, and I are, are currently writing a whole book on this topic, but uh, it, I think it hasn't been so much debated in, in India, and we want to inspire a lively debate. One case that cuts across all the others is class. Legal theorist William Ian Miller 
in his book, The Anatomy of Disgust, argued, following George Orwell, that class subordination is driven by the dynamic of bodily disgust and is therefore very difficult to remedy. And he did think that that would make egalitarian democracy impossible. But many theories of class hierarchy do not make stigma and disgust central features. So one of Laura Weinberg's paper will take up this difficult question. Now to remedies. The project's accent is on understanding prejudice and discrimination, not on crafting specific legal remedial interventions, but understanding is a necessary prelude to successful remediation. And it does suggest directions for legal and social change. We hope to give at least a flavor of what directions might be valuable. Um, my, my general normative conclusion in 2004 was the close study of the operations of disgust should, the very first thing that it should do is to give us a good reason not to base laws on disgust, but simply not making law in response to the signal of popular disgust is not enough to uproot discrimination. Institutional structures built on prejudice often need to be altered. <coughs> steps need to be taken to replace the damaging public discourse with a different discourse, the old exclusionary social structures with different structures. One example will help before I conclude. Children with mental and physical disabilities in the US used to, as I say, be excluded from publication, public education by law. In the 1970s, the courts declared that this exclusion was unconstitutional and that schools couldn't behave that way. However, since the whole system of education, as well as the physical environment, had been built for the so-called normal child, much more needed to be done. The wide range of laws and policies about public spaces, institutional spaces, that by now have supported the public education of children with disabilities are but a small part of what needs to be done. Still, I think this is a pretty promising case of work against stigma through institutional, environmental, and social change, and it can be examined for clues as to strategies that might bear fruit in other cases. So that conveys, I hope, a sense of the scope and direction of the project we're undertaking in the next three days. And so, now let the conference begin. The problem of why in subaltern studies writing about dominated groups in India, oppressed groups, we didn't recognize caste for what it was. We, uh, 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 the, uh, the argument, the evidence for discrimination, <coughs> the evidence for humiliation, uh, of certain groups of people clearly had to do with <coughs> not just caste, but body the markers in the 19th and early 20th century. Somebody is porting a certain kind of mustache would be beaten up by upper caste people, or women covering their breasts, or peasants wearing uh, sandals or, or footwear, uh, because these were clearly embodied markers of status. But we folded uh, these uh, phenomena into some theory of uh, a peasant-based revolution or a class-based revolution, and class kind of became um, the straight jacket with its blind spots, through which we did not quite recognize caste for what it was, even though in growing up we knew that caste was what um, made the Hindu soul sick, as it were. Um, so. So I, I began from uh, and there were arguments in the 50s about caste mobility, about Siba Foundation published a book arguing why caste was not race. Um, but clearly there was this awareness that there was discrimination, uh, forms of discrimination in the name of caste. Um, but the question I begin with is really why, <coughs> why when knowing about a problem usually leads to action or policy calculated to address it, and India has taken various measures uh, to address discrimination against Dalit, for instance. Why then the discrimination really doesn't ever completely cease? And um, so to understand, to this, understand this problem, I will make a very basic distinction between, let's say, discrimination and what I will call prejudice. Uh, so, and this has some resonance with what I was saying, we become cognitively aware of discriminatory practices and seek to explain them with different kinds of knowledges at hand. If you go back 
and read literature and tasks produced by Europeans who, colonial officials in the early 20th century, for instance, uh, they wanted to understand caste historically or in terms of proto-sociology. And the purpose always was to, this, or the assumption always was that if you understand something as to why it has happened and why it and how it works, you might then do something in the realms of legislation, economy, politics to, to combat uh, what you see as a, as a bad thing. Prejudice, on the other hand, is something different. It refers to the judgment you make of someone before you consciously touch them. So it's in that sense prejudice, as Gadamer explains in Truth and Method. These we imbibe from the earliest phase of our childhood as we come into the symbolic order and as grown-ups ex grown explain the world to us and guide us into it, as they necessarily have to. Prejudice becomes part of habitus to switch from Garama to Bochu, and oftentimes you see that the knowledge prejudice split in the same person, or if my logic is right, probably in all of us. In the interest of time, let me illustrate this point with the help of an autobiographical anecdote, and I apologize for making autobiography stand in for ethnographic or psychological research, but then 27 years, 27 continuous years in one place, I hope is much longer than the time an anthropologist would typically spend in the field over his or her entire life. So I claim a certain right to speak as a native turned anthropologist. When I was growing up in Calcutta in the 1950s, there was a very famous Bengali poem on the figure of the sweeper, typically untouchable, included in my school text. It was a stridently anti-untouchability poem, beginning with lines that Bengalis from my generation will still recite from memory. <clears throat> Who dares to call you untouchable and impure, my friend? This is how the poem began. Shotendranath Dotto, a grandson of a very well-known 19th century rationalist who died early in 1922 and was a follower of Mahatma Gandhi, wrote this poem, inspired by Gandhi, and so the poem, I guess, guess, was written sometime between 1915, when Gandhi comes back permanently to India, and 1922, when the poet dies. My mother, who was a teacher of Bengali literature in high school, would teach me the poem and explain with much sincerity and fervor the, the injustice of untouchability, how and how its every precept did violence to any fundamental principles of human equality and injustice. So this was a little Indian citizen in the making with the help of textbook and his mother explaining what the text, what the poem meant. But every morning, Lakshman, a Bihari Dalit, appointed by the city corporation to sweep our neighborhood clean, would moonlight by cleaning the toilets of the houses on our street, uh, standard practice for corporations to employ Dal ex Dalits or Dalits as sweepers, and standard practice for them to moonlight make more money by working during their working hours in, in private homes. Um, and my parents actually had a good relationship with Lakshman. He would come every morning. Lakshman would actually leave with my parents the money and other valuables whenever he went home on leave. Um, but, but never and never treated him as an untouchable person on those occasions. We would touch his hands to take his money or take his valuables on those social visits. But and Lakshman would come and sometimes introduce his son and members of his family. So there was a social relationship. But every morning, <coughs> when he came into our house as a sweeper, wielding a huge and wet jharu, a broomstick, with which we cleaned our laboratory, my mother would scramble to ensure that nothing, no draperies or curtains or pieces of furniture, was touched by him. As the jharu, producing in the process quite a, by the jharu, producing quite a commotion in the household, and Lakshman himself would walk around with extreme care, assuming a stiff and awkward bodily posture in these moments, ensuring that upper caste sensitivities about fecal matter were not offended. Growing into my high school years, I, I came to think of, my, think of this as my mother's hypocrisy, explaining the poem the night before and behaving thus the morning after. She really did not believe, I thought, in what the poem said. And the, message should ex ex and the message should explain to me by way of teaching me the right values, decrying untouchability. I realized later that I was perhaps wrong. She was sincere in explaining to me the injustice of untouchability. What was in evidence in Lakshman's entering our house was prejudice in the Gadamarian sense, 
my mother's deeply Brahminical sense of her own body that was revolted by the thought that Lakshma's charu containing fecal matter might touch anything in the household. The point was not about hygiene, that Mahat Mata has explained. It was about the body of the Dalit, qua Dalit. Formal knowledge of the oppression of Dalit historicizes or sociologizes the figure of the Dalit. Once you know the historical context that aids the exploitation of Dalits, you evolve policies uh, aimed at changing that context of Dalit's lives. But prejudice, the judgment you make, you have before you deliberately judge, reproduces a structure with time constituting a very long and stable present. Let me return then to the Dalit body of this structure, the body that is marked by its involvement with both fecal matter and the skin of dead animals, or with death itself, as in the very well-known Hindu legend of the famous mythical Raja Harishtan, uh, the, the figure of the Chandala, the dome, that occurs in several Puranas, and, and in the Mahabharata, and actually influenced Gandhi, as you know. The Dalit's body is thus always already marked in its social imposed, socially imposed contact with fecal matter and death. So I'm thinking of a you know, the move I'm making is a far very Fanovian move, the way that Fanon thinks about the black body, in black and white mask, mask or wretched of the earth. Uh, that the, the body that deals with fecal matter and death, I mean, I could give ethnographic examples here, Gyan Prakash, the wonderful discussion of what landlords in Bihar used to do with Dalits, give, make them do the first plowing of the, of the earth on the, from the fear that the earth gives off uh, death in matter when it's first plowed, and there's the first and to plow the earth had to be a Dalit, like a buffer body. So uh, the Dalit's body was like a buffer between life and death. It absorbed all that could spell death to humans. And again, I do not wish to enter policy or legal debates here. We are not competent, and, but which is not to devalue these uh, initiatives. Subaltern studies failed to account for the Dalit because it had no material theory of the body. Uh, but that is also where not, I don't want to go there. I want to suggest to you that once you grant me the structure of exclusion, the reaction of disgust the Dalit body produces in the bodies of cleaner caste, we can think of Dalit body as precisely the body that helps us to think the planet in this age of the environmental crisis that passes by the name of global warming. To do so, however, we need to get beyond the moves in political philosophy that privilege the abstract, unmarked body either as the carrier of rights or as the ground on which to situate that Marxist category of abstract labor so necessary to Marxist critique of capital. Fanon said, under the influence of Merleau-Ponty, that the black person had no corporeal schema. It is possible for a non-black person, in his argument, to forget, for instance, that his or her own, his or her own particular body, look what his or her particular body looks like, to forget what it looks like, and to be aware in everyday consciousness of just a bodily schema, such as just having a vague awareness that he or she has two hands without necessarily remembering them or visualizing their color or the shape or their age. The black person could not do that, said Fanon, for he or she could never forget, even in their sleep, that he or she was black. So deep was the mark that race left on their embodied sense of themselves. Since the fact is often forgotten, forgotten in ontological thought, that the human, uh, in ontological thought about the human, where in that thought the human stands all alone and in abstraction from other forms of life uh, in the world, the Dalit's body can be seen as both an acknowledgement of and a reminder of all the other living bodies we need in order to keep human bodies alive. The microbes in our guts and in animal bodies, and of course animals themselves. How else would be human? Would we be human without them? If we could, if we could get out, even in pro Dalit thought that only focuses on injustice between humans alone, of anthropocentric thinking, then the Dalit's body is the body that makes us aware of all the networks of connections between different life forms that enables humans as a form of creaturely life to survive. The Dalit's body is itself constructed non-anthropocentrically in the schematic presentation I'm making. It will always be a matter of being human with animals, that is being with, with animals life or death, and being embedded in the world of microbes, which is exactly uh, there in the Dalit's relationship to waste 
and fecal matter. In that sense, the Dalit's body is what I might call a planetary body, or in other words, a body suffused with planetary consciousness. I'll just come back to this when I end by referring to Rahis Bermuda, the famous Dalit of our time, in the suicide letter that he wrote when he killed himself in Hyderabad uh, recently. Let me once again take a step back and explain. It is becoming increasingly clear that the present scale of human activities is causing very serious disturbances, not only to the Earth system, but also to the distribution of natural reproductive life on a planet. Though, if you were a Trump, you would think that we solved the problem on 8th of November. Uh, and, you know, this is a Chinese hoax, but this is what the Chinese hoax suggests. Some biologists seriously argue that we have entered the first phase of a sixth great extinction of species that may gain full momentum in the next two to 600 years. While many in animal studies used to argue in the 1970s and 80s, and many still do, that humans would take charge of the planet or nature by extending the human moral domain all over the planet, the knowledge that the bulk of life is microbial in form upsets that thinking because we do not know what moral or custodial relations are possible for humans to form with bacteria and viruses, even though we know that viruses have played a role in human evolution, particularly producing phenotypical differences. <clears throat> it is also becoming clear at the same time that human life and the question of its continuation on the planet is deeply tied to the fact that multiple other life forms have to flourish in order for us to enjoy the food web in which we are embedded even if we are situated at a critical nodal point in the web. This raises new questions about our political categories that are usually imagined in profoundly anthropocentric ways. And I want to show you just two uh, uh, quick video clips of animals and the human-animal conflict currently going on in this part of the world, in India. Can I have the two clips, please? So this is a leopard looking for lunch in Mumbai. While the animals are trying to be urban. Yeah, can we? Yeah. No, can we get, get back to the earlier one, please, before we tap this one? Yeah, can you, yeah. You have to, yeah, now, see, the letter, see, so. This is Mumbai. This is happening throughout India. Wild animals, actually, throughout the world are trying to become urban. It is no exception. And can we have the next one, please? This is from my store a few years ago. Elephants in the city. Dramatic visual of an elephant running amok in the city of my And the consequences were tragic. One man was trampled and gored to death. A cow was also killed. Vehicles were damaged as the panicked and confused animal tried to avoid the crowd that had gathered around it. The young male elephant was finally tranquilized by officials from the forest department. Its companion, the second elephant that had wandered into Mysore from nearby forests, took much longer to tranquilize and capture. Domesticated elephants were brought in to help in the operation. The habitat of elephants is being increasingly eroded by human beings and they frequently venture into human habitation with consequences that are tragic for both sides. An unruly crowd is often the biggest challenge. Okay, thank you. This is happening every day. Indian newspapers are full of little items of news. I have not seen an Indian thinker reflect on this everyday problem. So take that human-animal conflict that is ubiquitous in India today. The question is, contra Hannah Arendt, can we still go on thinking of the, the figure of the refugee as human alone? Do we have to think of the leopard as a refugee? Do we have to think of the, the, the elephant as a refugee and what happens to our notions of rights and things once we begin to do this? But we, before that, we need to acknowledge the relationship that human life has to these forms of life in order for its own form to flourish and, 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 and continue to flourish. Should we not then think of the leopard and the elephant as refugees too? And we have not even begun to think about our relationship 
to microbial life. The biology systems have definite knowledge of their role in our past and futures. However, we find, a, however, we, where we try to find a beginning to such thinking, we need to imagine the human not in isolation from other forms of life, as we do in the blinding light of humanism, but as a form of life connected to other forms of life that are all connected to the planet and are dependent on this connection for their own welfare. And I should mention here, there's a book called Atmospheric Justice by a political scientist called Steve Vanderheide, who's trying to extend roles and paradigms to the question of climate justice. The first chapter acknowledges that the atmosphere is shared between humans and other forms of life. And the book end, ends by actually concluding that the Rawlsian form of justice doesn't give him any way to think about questions of justice between humans and non-human form of life, like the plant form of life, for instance, where oxygen is still needed. So in the end, he, he keeps his analysis confined to humans alone. I call this new imagination of the human the imagination of a body that we need in order to evolve a planetary form of consciousness. This is indeed the meaning that I suggest Rohit Vemula, the untouchable Dalit, uh, ex-untouchable Dalit student who killed himself in Hyderabad and whose suicide led to so much student movement. I suggest this is what he actually meant when in his suicide letter he celebrated man as a glorious thing made up of stardust. And you know, when this expression came out, because most of our journalists don't read science, and they know of Stardust as a film magazine, uh, people thought this was just a rhetorical flourish. But Rohit Vemula was actually a student of science. And he knew that uh, the human body actually still carries particles, subparticles produced at the time of the Big Bang. And the book on it, a very good book on it, has been written by my Chicago colleague, Neil Shubin. And his book is called the universe within the deep history of the human body. And I suggest that Rohit Vemula's suicide note be produced in the Indian Express of January 19, 2016, actually making that scientific point. Why don't you dissolve my Dalit body into the human body that has connections not simply to animal life around us, but actually to the history of the planet, to the geology of the Big Bang itself. And that's a scientific point that Neil Shubin has made. So the Dalit body with its inseparability from waste, micro, animal, and life and death processes remains, precisely because of the Brahminical disgust, a site for simultaneous avowal and disavowal of the human as we urgently need to imagine her. And so I want to end by suggesting that actually in my sort of quasi fanorian <coughs> schema, the Dalit body gives us a vantage point from which to actually imagine the new human body we would need that should be, you know, if we have, if we have to imagine humans of the future whose consciousness is primarily planetary and not national. Thank you very much. And now we have another treat and we welcome Ashwini Deshpande, one of India's leading social scientists from Delhi University. I uh, work on um, caste discrimination, disparities, labor market outcomes, and so on. Um, so that's, that's a body of work, and I work on affirmative action quite a bit. Uh, what I am trying to do over the last year is to examine the question of stigma from the lens of affirmative action. So the idea is, um, uh, the idea is to see, um, uh, uh, to examine the following question, which is, uh, one of the long-standing criticisms of affirmative action has been that it excludes more meritorious individuals and displaces them and puts in place less deserving and less meritorious individuals on the basis of some group identity. Uh, so it could be the desire for equality, social justice, whatever it might be, or to counter discrimination. But the idea is that it's unfair to the non-beneficiaries because they deserve to be in an institution and they are not allowed to be because of um, affirmative action, and that criticism has been, uh, you know, widely studied across uh, different contexts, and it's a criticism that's not contingent upon the form of aff affirmative action. So you can have quotas, you can have preferences, you can have anything else, but the criticism remains exactly the same. So it's about the policy rather than about the particular instrument that might be used. Uh, Complementary critique is now developing in the affirmative action literature, uh, which is that 
affirmative action in addition to being harmful to the non-beneficiaries could actually be harmful to the beneficiaries of, uh, of uh, affirmative action. And uh, therefore, it might actually be doing more harm than good. It might be a well-intentioned policy, but it actually ends up harming those who get the benefit of affirmative action. And there are two uh, major strands in this argument. Uh, and there are nuances within each of these, but I'm just summarizing the two major strands. One is what is called the mismatch hypothesis. Uh, the idea is that beneficiaries typically tend to belong to groups that have suffered you know, discrimination in early life uh, outcomes, have gone to inferior schools, might come from poorer families, et cetera, et cetera. So there might be a range of disabilities that beneficiaries have had to face before they enter the institution into which they get admission because of uh, affirmative action, and this could be education or jobs, but as a result of which they are set up for failure. So they are, they are pushed into institutional contexts in which they cannot perform up to the standard that the institution demands them uh, to perform. And therefore, there's a mismatch between the, the demands of the institution and the abil in intrinsic abilities of these individuals. And it may not be their fault. It's just the, that's the way life is, has been for them. And so by setting them up, them up for failure, uh, affirmative action might end up actually discouraging them and in lowering their self-esteem. And to prove to society the, prove, uh, the stereotypes about these groups, saying that, well, they don't deserve to be here because they're not good enough, uh, et cetera. So there's the mismatch argument. Related to this, but somewhat distinct, is another argument, which is that in addition to being considered incompetent on account of who they are, on account of their identity, the fact that some standard had to be changed or lowered in order to get them admission must mean that they're incompetent intrinsically. So it's kind of related to the mismatch, but it's, it takes a different route. So the idea uh, here is that uh, affirmative action beneficiaries are doubly stigmatized. One, because of who they are, because of their caste, or in India, or gender, or race, or whatever, but also additionally to be seen by their peers as incompetent. And uh, that's not a nice feeling. And so in, a, so in addition to the mismatch that might may or may not occur, uh, the fact that there is uh, a double stigmatization of recipients, uh, that makes it not a good policy uh, to, um, to um, follow. Now, you know, I'm an empirical economist. I look at numbers. Uh, I, I, you know, give me a concept. I want to see how I can measure it. And so the, when you think about and the added stigma of affirmative action, one of the issues is how do you, how do you measure that? It's hard to gauge. It's hard to grasp. Why? Because you would need a counterfactual scenario. So you have, an, you have individuals who are into, in, inside institutions on the basis of affirmative action. Uh, so if they are stigmatized, and if a part of that stigma is related to the double stigma of affirmative action, what would have been the stigma had they not been beneficiaries of affirmative action? So you need a counterfactual here, which is difficult in any given context to estimate because those individuals are already in institutions with affirmative action. So what is the counterfactual? To, uh, to measure uh, uh, when you're looking at affirmative action. Uh, so would they be any less stigmatized? Had they gone into settings, either education or jobs, or any, set up their own businesses or whatever else, uh, where they, they didn't have to take recourse to affirmative action? So one way to look at it would be look at averages. So look at individual students, for example, in, in the universities in India, where the scheduled caste or tribe Dalit students are likely to have been admitted through affirmative action, and look at similar Dalits who are not in, in colleges, and look at their outcomes. So that would, be, that would give you some sense of the added sigma, but that's not really a very appropriate way to do that, because many things are different between the group that gained admission and the group that didn't get admission. So how much of that difference is because of affirmative action, it's hard to tell. Um, also, it depends on how stigmatized the group already is. Right? So if it's a highly stigmatized group, then it's highly likely that they're going to be stigmatized no matter what. Whereas it's, if it's a group that's typically not that stigmatized, in the context of India, for caste, for example, there are two administrative categories, the scheduled castes and tribes, on the one hand, and the other backward classes, the OBCs. Now, OBCs, because of historical reasons, are not as stigmatized as, as the Dalits are. And so it could be the case that the added stigma of affirmative action might be greater for OBCs because Elsewhere, they would be less stigmatized than Dalits, whereas that might not be the case with Dalits, particularly the lowest ranks Dalits that deal with occupations that were referred to earlier, which is cleaning of 
um, uh, human excreta uh, dealing with dead animals and so on and so forth. So those are the, even within Dalits, they are the most stigmatized uh, groups. So it seemed to me when I looked at the literature that there were three dimensions that could, of this for problem that could be explored more directly. Uh, and they, hadn't, they haven't been done in the context of India. They, I've seen literature on this in the US context, but not so much in India. First is a psychological ex, uh, exploration of whether, so, so let's assume stigma exists in institutions where beneficiaries get in through affirmative action. Do the beneficiaries internalize the stigma? This is important because if they internalize the stigma, then that can have serious consequences for their performance. And even if they were not originally mismatched, if they internalize their stigma, that could lead to a mismatch in the sense that they perform worse because they now believe themselves to be less competent, regardless of whether they were or not less competent to begin with. So that's one question. Second, and this is a question on which there are, there are there's just one paper actually uh, for India, which is, does the fear of stigmatization prevent the uptake of affirmative action. Are people not ready to use quotas anymore because they don't <clears throat> want to be stigmatized as, uh, as less competent? And uh, a third quest, third uh, larger issue, which is related to the Rohit Vemula uh, uh, reference that you heard before, is what is the experience of those who get into institutions on affirmative action? How are they assimilated? What is the integration? And particularly those who successfully graduate. So we hear a lot about dropouts of Dalits and how they are not suited, et cetera, et cetera. And I believe that there is a very large group that actually successfully graduates. And there's very little attention on that group. And, and so one of the things I've tried to do in the paper is to actually look at some qualitative accounts of those who successfully graduate and ask them, what was it like being in an institution when you got in through a quota? Uh, and so that would also address some ele elements of the stigma uh, question. I have a companion paper, which is on this question of internalization versus externalization. Uh, externalization in the literature basically just refers to the fact that peers stigmatize those who get in on affirmative actions. So externalization means externally the stigma exists. Uh, and the earlier literature on stigmatization was all about internalization, which is that it was never thought possible that those who are stigmatized don't actually accept the stigma. It was always seen as, as a corollary to the stigma that you are stigmatized and so you believe you are stigmatized. I mean, so it's kind of, it's the same thing. Now in the social psychology literature, there's, a, a, there's an attempt to bifurcate the two issues, which is peers stigmatize you, so there's externalization, but those who are stigmatized may not necessarily internalize the stigma. And the consequences of that could be different depending on the presence of externalization or internalization. So uh, that paper is out there in the public domain. I, uh, you know, I can share that with you uh, at another time. But basically, in my survey that I did, I found evidence of externalization, in other words, of stigma. But that is stigmatization by peers. But the beneficiaries didn't necessarily internalize that stigma. They didn't feel that they were less competent or that they didn't deserve to be in the institution, et cetera, uh, and so on. This should be taken with a, with, a, with a caveat, which is that this is not a universal finding applicable to all contexts. You have many other contexts in which uh, a, a low self-esteem might actually be internalized by, by those who, who, who are ranked low by society. So it, you know, that, that it's a complicated. Uh, so I, for example, looked at rem, uh, what level of earnings would individuals consider remunerative. And you find actually very significant caste differences, even after you account for income and all other things that might account for this, uh, for the response. In other words, Dalits find lower earnings remunerative compared to upper caste, even after you've accounted for everything uh, that might go into uh, what people find. So, you know, so they might feel that they're less worthy because society feels they're less worthy and so on. So there are, there are in other contexts, examples of internalization. I'll skip this slide that was the pathways to internalization, but that's another paper and I don't want to get caught in talking about that paper. I can come back to that later in the questions. Um, in the context of India, there are just basically two papers that look at the second question that I raised, which is the uptake of affirmative action. One is a paper by Ajabudavarti, which is uh, not an empirical paper. It's about uh, affirmative action being extended to the other backward classes, which are somewhat higher ranked than the Dalits. Um, and his, uh, his argument is basically it will help to destigmatize reservations because now the better off groups are also taking ref reservations, so people will not think of reservations as a very stigmatizing phenomenon. And there's only one empirical paper uh, uh, by Veronique Gilles which actually estimates 
what I also do in this particular paper. Uh, but the issue there is that the data set that she uses doesn't actually allow a sufficient estimation of this problem. So the question in that data set, which Veronique Gilles uses is, have you or any member of your family taken advantage of provisions under reservations to seek admission in educational institution in 2005 and 6? This is asked without reference to whether you actually studied in an educational institution or not. So supposing I didn't study, my answer to this question is going to be no, and therefore all of it has been interpreted as stigma. Whereas if I didn't study, I didn't need to take advantage of a, a reservation. So it's a very uh, glaring omission in the data set. It's not the author's fault, but it's a glaring omission in the data set that doesn't allow her to compute. So a no answer here is interpreted as stigma, which I think is a bit of a stretch. Um, so I uh, am doing a, a separate project on social mobility. And as a part of that, I did a primary survey in the city of Delhi in 2014-15. Because I was interested in this question of stigma, uh, while that survey was not about stigma, I added a module to gauge these precise questions in which I'm interested. And what I did was ask specifically those who were eligible, that is, those who belong to the administrative categories of scheduled castes and tribes and OBCs, uh, <clears throat> who used quotas, either for education or jobs, and if they did not, why not? And you know, a bunch of answers were, responses were given to them, including the, the provision for them to supply their own uh, answers. And so this was actually a more direct, uh, th this data set allowed me actually to examine the precise question of the uptake of quotas, uh, uptake of reservations based on the question of stigmatization. And so of the 1,049 uh, students who were, in, um, young men who were in my sample, 410 were eligible for affirmative action, 229 scheduled castes, and 181 OBC uh, individuals. Uh, of these, 27% used reservations either for jobs or for education. A greater proportion of scheduled castes or Dalits used reservations as compared to OBCs. Uh, so for example, of, those, of these 114, those who used reservations, 89% were Dalit and 11% OBCs. Now, these individuals went to, uh, they graduated from high school in 2003. So if they went to college, it was soon after that. 2004, 5, and 6. OBC reservations in higher education kicked in in 2006, and they became operationalized in 2008. So many of these OBC men were out of college already by the time the OBC quotas came into Delhi in colleges. So many of them told me that they would have used. So this no here, again, doesn't mean that it was all because of stigma, because they would have used quotas if they had occasion to. And so therefore, what I did was uh, so here's just a picture which shows that uh, shows what I uh, told you already, which is the no yes answers. Did you use quotas at all for jobs and education? Um, uh, so if you look at just the educational quota, uh, the lower use of OBC quota is not surprising, as I said, because they were not eligible at the time that the survey was conducted. And in verbal responses, many of them said that they would have used quotas if they uh, had they been in place. Now the interesting thing about job quotas, again, people say, oh, it's stigmatization. People don't want to use it. The fact is. Job quotas are uh, applicable only in government jobs. So if you are in a private sector job, again, there's no occasion to use the quota because there are no quotas that, uh, so the, the prior question to ask, which surveys typically don't ask, is are you working in a government job or in a private sector job? And so here you see only 13% of the sample was uh, working in uh, government jobs, of which 15% uh, short schedule costs and 10.5% uh, OBCs. So basically 87% of the sample did not work in government jobs where quotas are applicable. And of those working in government jobs, 36% use reservation. So again, it's not a very high number, but, uh, but we'll see why you know, in a bit when we, when we talk about this. So again, some prima facie indication of stigma affecting uptake, but we'll, we'll, we have to. Uh, uh, the interesting thing, which is a little bit of an aside, which is I was surprised to find that 50s, and these are all young men in Delhi, in the city of Delhi, who did their high school in Delhi in government schools, 56% of these, more than half, were first generation beneficiaries of quotas. Uh, so nobody in their family had ever used reservations before. And this is striking to me in the context of this demand for abolition of, you know, people are saying it's been going on for too long now, everybody has got quotas and this is just getting too much, it's out of hand. Fact is, it isn't so much out of hand, you know, I mean, I know that is one sample, etc. But these are figures that would not be uncommon to find in other samples as well. If they, uh, so we really have a problem here of uptake, not related to stigma, but just overall for, for a variety of other reasons. So I don't think 
the time has come to abolish the system before it actually gets implemented uh, properly. So I think the issue is really implementation rather than abolition. 80% uh, of OBCs were first generation beneficiaries, again not surprising given there's a much longer history of Dalit quotas than OBC quotas. Um, so you know, what explains the probability of that somebody would use reservations or not? So there are regressions which I haven't reported in the paper, but basically what, what, this, what the results show is that within the sample, the better of students, those who did better in class 12, so the more competent ones, uh, who had more ed higher educated fathers, fathers with higher levels of education, uh, those who were middle class, uh, using uh, you know class and categories that are created. So it's in a way a bit counterintuitive in the sense it's opposite to what I originally expected. You, I thought that the poorest people would actually be using. These are all people uh, who already ha are within the sample relatively more advantaged. And it's actually, when you think about it, it's not that surprising because these are people who are poised, who have the initial conditions, background conditions for success in later life. And quotas can really give that little push. But in order to be able to go make you good use of the push, uh, you know, these conditions are important. And I think this is an important uh, um, issue that comes up with, uh, you know, related to other debates on affirmative action here. Now I come to the reasons for why. So the, now this is asked to people who could have used reservations but did not. And so I give them a bunch of uh, options and they also have a chance to uh, verbalize some other responses that I may not have provided them. Uh, and so summing up these responses, they, it looks a little bit like this, which is not eligible to show that I could do without government help. I don't really need help from the government. I did not want the additional stigma of reservations. Uh, I didn't know about reservations. Um, I didn't have occasion to use it. For example, I went to a private job or uh, didn't study further, and bureaucratic difficulties. And then when they say bureaucratic difficulties, I asked them to say, spell out exactly what, what they meant. And I'm going to show you a little in a bit of what they meant. But if you see these responses, you can perhaps think of the second and the third one as a broad um, indication of stigma, that I don't really want to use it because I don't want to sh I'm not dependent on anyone or I can. So that's what I, I use, the second and the third combined as some indication of stigma. And if you see that, then it's really uh, about 16% of the sample that says that I didn't use reservations because of these two reasons. So 84% of non-use is really because of all these other reasons. Take the first one, not eligible. That doesn't even make sense because they are eligible. Right? So when they are not eligible, they, it's something else. So then, you, then, then I ask them, well, what do you mean by you're not eligible? They'll say something like, oh, I, was, I took my caste certificate to the college, and they said, no, 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 this is not valid, and things like that. So what it boils down really is to, um, uh, and also it came up in the bureaucratic difficulties, it boils down to a set of factors that reflect institutional apathy and an unwillingness to admit students on quota and finding all kinds of ways to keep them out. Because it's constitutional, you have to have quotas in uh, uh, government-sponsored educational institutions, but then you find other ways to keep them out. So somebody said the process is very complicated. It need not be, but on, on the ground it is. Mm, the documentation required is tough. It's not supposed to be, but on the ground it is. Uh, caste certificates from my village were not accepted. Uh, I was asked to make fresh certificates in the city, which is a nightmare uh, for anyone wanting any certificate or anything. Um, uh, corruption, many, many in students reported for being asked for bribes to get what is really uh, right for them. Um, somebody said, tried to use reservations on an earlier occasion, didn't make it, was so difficult, didn't try again the second time, even though I could have, etc. So basically, there's a whole range of reasons why, which are institutional barriers uh, for, uh, for a system that actually is a right for, for, these, uh, for these students. Um, there is, a, however, a class dimension to it. So I, I have in my data set in, uh, indications on uh, assets in the, in the household. And so if I just divide them by, in a very rough way by bottom 40%, middle 40%, and top, then the richer, uh, the richer uh, households, if you see the, you know, here, don't need and do not stigmatization, then you, as you, the richer households, you cite stigma as a bigger reason. So yeah, so there is an element of stigma, and it's really uh, the richer you are, you probably feel uh, you know, more stigmatized. So there is, there is an element there, but bulk of the non-use is not because of stigma. Um, 
So then I want, I did a little bit uh, in preparation for this conference because it was multidisciplinary. I moved out of my comfort zone a little bit on uh, dealing with numbers and I actually thought, okay, let me talk to people <laughs> and get some voices on the ground. So uh, my, uh, my uh, uh, a separate uh, survey and so three students of mine and I, we interviewed successful graduates. Now this is not a representative sample or anything. It's not what economists will call, have look at co as kosher at all. Uh, because what I did basically was ask my students, I say, you know, just look at people that you know, your friends, their friends, etc. Basically, people who've successfully completed their program, so not the dropouts. And so we were managed to get these uh, actually quite fascinating accounts uh, of 60 individuals who had used quotas either for jobs or for education. And I have uh, discussed the the main, uh, you know, the responses in the paper. I, I won't go into all of that. And so these were semi-structured interviews in the sense I got a minimum information from everybody, but then I, I, I let it flow. I, I let them talk and say whatever uh, they had to say. And, um, the, uh, you know, and I also asked them about their particular jati. So it wasn't just by administrative categories, but actually what their jati were. And it was interesting that the chamar jati or the jatas, those who use with, traditionally used with, uh, are associated with leather work, uh, even though they or their fathers are no longer associated with that occupation, They've, they definitely wished that they were born into another caste. And this was you know, a point that Martha makes about you know, how stereotypes stick. And so it's not that their families were actually involved in the leather business, because I asked them about what their fathers did, mothers did. But it's just a stereotype that stuck. And they, uh, they feel that life would have been better if had they not been born as chamas. So they definitely wished for that. Again, not to say that all chamas would wish for this, but, but there's, a f there's a feeling. But you know, what this points towards is not really the stigma that they face necessarily inside the institution. So it's not necessarily the stigma of affirmative action. It's just a stigma of being who they are, I think. That's more, that was my interpretation. Of course, it's a little bit hard to disentangle, but that was that. Uh, they, these accounts actually brought out uh, many layers along which these uh, individuals felt disadvantaged or discriminated. So linguistic barrier was one big issue that came up, lack of fluency in English. Almost everybody talked about it, that I just felt that I needed to be able to speak English better. And again, being in Delhi University, I'm not surprised that that was what they were saying. Uh, many people talked about dress. One uh, person actually talked about how uh, if he dressed well, then he was in the hostel, so his upper caste peers knew that he was chamar. But if he dressed well, they would say, oh, so now you're so, you think you're too big, huh? That you all want, you want to dress up nicely and look like us. And so he said, if I dressed well, I would be taunted. But if I didn't dress well, I would be taunted again, right? So it was, a, it was just a, 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 a very difficult situation for him to be in. So he wanted to fit in, and so he would try to emulate the dress that his peers were wearing. But then you say, oh, now you're too big for your boots. Now you think you can look like us, et cetera. So he, he felt particularly disadvantaged. Um, people talked about skill sets. They talked about how they didn't have the skills when they went into the market, job markets. Uh, sorry, that's a spelling mistake, networks. Um, um, people talked about the lack of good networks that disadvantaged them when they went in for jobs. And, and interestingly, some didn't report any adverse experience. They said it was fine, you know, uh, it was good. And there are accounts of intersecting identity. So there could be a Muslim OBC who got in through a quota, through an OBC quota, but he talked about how being Muslim uh, made the teacher talk about you know religion and religion and terror and obscurantism etc. And he was made to feel uncomfortable and things like oh you know you're responsible for the partition of the country and things like that you know so uh, he was made to feel uh, responsible for that. Tribal students uh, talked about uh, racist slurs uh, you used very commonly in conversation um, uh, that which they felt was humiliating. Uh, th there was one visually impaired person in my in this in these interviews, and he felt stigmatized by excessive sympathy. He said that everybody was so conscious of the fact that I was visually impaired. People were constantly trying to help me, etc. Wouldn't let me do anything on my own. So he said they were well-meaning, but they didn't realize that they were actually constantly setting me apart because of uh, my imp uh, impairment. So that raises the difficult question of what is it? How do you tread the fine line being sympathetic and not being patronizing? You know, so you might be well-meaning, but might end up becoming patronizing. So that's a larger question. I talked about this. Uh, one issue that came up in many interviews is being a first-generation learner. So people, you know, this is uh, who you talked about it. I think about how their mothers were, dis you know, they were illiterate and they felt 
And so this is something that many respondents said that our mothers weren't able to help us with homework and fathers weren't at home. And other kids had mothers to help them with homework and we felt disadvantaged, particularly those who went into college because nobody had gone to college before. So they brought on back all these textbooks which didn't, was, you know, very alien. Um, female voices, very few, not even 10 in the sample of 61, which is not surprising because there's other evidence to uh, indicate that <coughs> The beneficiaries of caste quotas are disproportionately male. Uh, there's, in fact, an excellent paper by Marian Bertrand, who's at uh, University of Chicago, um, a very, very fine paper on the mismatch hypothesis and how that's not true in engineering colleges. And she finds exactly the same result, which is that it's disproportionately male, the beneficiaries are. And so I find that also in this limited sample. Um, and women's stories are slightly different. They talk about different things. But many of these stories also come in uh, to that uh, picture. But again, when they talk about their accounts, it's hard to disentangle the gender and caste, you know, how much of it is because of the fact that they are women versus uh, being Dalit. Uh, uh, one story that came about in several accounts is stigmatization from not their peers, but by, for example, the office staff. So somebody who got a, a scholarship, so definitely not non-meritorious, when he, each time he used to go to collect his scholarship money, the person would say, oh, you must have got it on a quota or something. Another person said, I was just told to say, why do you bother? Just study for the IAS, you know, administrative serv civil services exams because there's a quota there and you can just get in. You can just walk in. You know, it's a highly competitive exam. But the myth is that if you're Dalit, you can just walk into it, which is not at all true. Um, uh, incidentally, the topper for this year's, uh, this highly competitive exam is a Dalit girl. So it's a quite a, quite a spectacular, you know, uh, achievement for her. And obviously, she made it without, not as a quota person, but just as a person. Uh, but basically, uh, many people were told, why do you bother? Just prepare for the IAS, and you know, you, you'll just walk in. Then uh, many respondents reported about being uh, taunted or stigmatized by teachers in school, where they were not there through quotas. They were just getting an education, and teachers would discourage them from saying, why do you, why do you go to college? It's not for you. You know, you better look for something more practical. Uh, and just learn a skill or a little trade and just start doing it rather than block seats in colleges, etc. So they were discouraged from even aspiring to be someone different. You know, so it's, uh, and these are people who didn't heed to those discouragements and actually successfully graduated. So you can imagine that there must be a whole uh, uh, a group of individuals who must have been discouraged and said, okay, maybe my teachers are saying college is not for me, so maybe it isn't for me. And we wouldn't pick up those voices here because that's, these are people who actually did uh, did successfully graduate. So a uh, few concluding comments. Uh, on uptake of quotas, I think stigma is not absent, but it's a part, only a small part of the reason why uh, people don't uh, take up reservations. Um, bulk of the non-use is because of institutional apathy, um, bureaucratic di difficulties, and for jobs, it's the sheer paucity of government jobs. There aren't enough government jobs. So even if there were no institutional barriers, there aren't enough jobs for you to, uh, you know, so that if you see the private sector, public sector, it's a completely opposite trajectory. Public sector jobs are shrinking, private sector jobs are rising. And so that's a macro picture about employment in India.